my endurance just took off. Honest to goodness, I told you guys at the beginning of this interview that that I, I ran 24 miles uh, this past Sunday. I could have ran yesterday. I could have gone out and ran yesterday. And, you know, being a 59-year-old man, I, I have no pain, no inflammation, no knee problems, nothing. And my endurance just took off. I mean, it just, my endurance is shot through the roof. Welcome to the Gene Food Podcast. I'm your host, John O'Connor. Hey guys, today we have a different type of episode than what we've done in the past. We're actually doing a case study. Many of you are interested in preventing cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's. And we have had a lot of interest and questions about um, ApoE4 specifically. For those of you who don't know, ApoE4 is a gene that increases your risk for Alzheimer's as you get older. doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's, but it, it has been shown to increase risk. And so we have an opportunity today to speak with Gerald Holbrook. Gerald is an ultra marathon runner uh, in the Houston area, and he has um, done a gene food panel. He's changed his diet according to his genetics. And one of the big markers that he has an eye on is um, his ApoE4 status. So we're going to get into the details of why we selected the diet we did for Gerald. We have Aaron, who's our head of research and geneticist on the show. And he gets into the individual markers that we used to categorize Aaron the way we did. We put him on a diet that's very low in saturated fat. And we have before and after blood work. So we talk about what does blood work look before when he was on a different style of diet and what his blood looks like now that he's on a diet that we see as being more suited to his genetics. It's an interesting deep dive into one person's story about how they're eating, how they're trying to protect their brain as they get older. I think you're going to enjoy it. There's a lot of good information here. And we hope that you can use uh, Gerald's story to find out what works best for you in your journey towards health and wellness. So without further ado, here is Gerald. So for those listening at home, we have three people on the call today. We have Dr. Aaron. Those of you who have listened to episodes in the past know Aaron. He's been a regular guest on the show. He's the head of research and geneticist at Gene Food. And he's here. He's going to do some uh, genetic analysis of, uh, of Gerald's charts later in the show. And of course, we have Gerald Holbrook, who's an ultra marathon runner, uh, family man, and uh, athlete in, um, in Texas. So Gerald, you are someone who's been a long time runner, I believe. Is that correct? So I've been doing ultra marathons probably for since about 2010. Okay. I did, uh, uh, I did Leadville 100. And uh, so, yeah, so it's about, so it's about 2010, but I've been running competitively since I was in my 20s. And I took a break in my, in my 40s and then I decided... Once I reached my 50s, I wanted to get back into uh, in more of uh, doing some more running events. And so the, uh, my, my daughter sent me a book, The Ultra Marathon Man. I read the book Born to Run. Was it, and it started, kind of got inspired to do uh, 100 miles and ultra marathon runs after, uh, after competing in 5Ks, 10Ks, and marathons and events like that. So. So yeah, I started doing ultra marathons. So when you were running in your twenties, were you running on a college team or something, or how, how did that? No, I no, I didn't run in college, but uh, I did run for uh, some uh, a sporting goods company that was that was uh, sponsored by Nike, and so there w- there was a few uh, invited individuals that would be picked out in the regional area, and uh, and we would go to races and uh, compete against other local companies and we would and we would be sponsored by the sporting goods company and then we would wear their shirts and uh wear nike gear and uh we would go around the areas and and we'd win these races you know i would be in first second or third in these typical races and uh did that for about 10 years you know competing and i mean i continued to race but uh work work and family got in the way so uh I was able, I started, I was, I wasn't able to compete in that type of, uh, in those type of events anymore, but I still competed. I was just, I was moving around the country at that time. Gotcha. So you took a little hiatus maybe when your kids were younger. Yeah, I took a, I, I took a little hiatus actually about after my, uh, I ran a marathon in Detroit, the, uh, Detroit free press marathon where you run underneath the bridge from Canada to Detroit. Cool. And I did that when I, uh, and then I kind of, uh, kind of retired as far as competing in, in, uh, races at that point. 
for about, mm, I'd say about eight years. I just, I mean, I was still working out every day. I was still lifting weights and everything, but I just kind of, uh, uh, got burned out on on just doing the races every weekend. So so we're about forty to fifty. I I just I kind of stopped until until I got inspired again to start doing ultra races along with my weight training. I've always did I've always did uh, you know some weight training along with uh, cardio at the same time. But uh, I did take a little break from any of the competitive races uh, in my forties. Cool. I actually uh, am from Detroit uh, originally. Grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. So that marathon that goes, you, so it goes across the Ambassador Bridge. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So you, yep. you basically loop through Windsor and then you. Well, you, well, they, well, they bust you over there, and they start you over in Canada, and, and then you run underneath the the, in the tunnel underneath the Detroit River. Oh. Okay. And then, cool. Okay. Yeah. And so they they do that, and then you finish. Then you finish in downtown Detroit. It's a it's a very it's a it's a cool marathon. Yeah, I was really disappointed in that race. I was I was shooting for a uh, sub three hour, and I finished up. I made the mistake of uh, wearing some uh, brand new racing flats, thinking I was really going to uh, <laughs> break my all time best. And I ended up running like a three hour and eleven minute marathon. But uh, yeah, I was disappointed because I was like a sub two forty five at the twenty mile mark, but my uh, I had blisters and yeah, the, the shoes didn't work out correctly. Like I thought. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh Detroit's come a long way for people listening at home that aren't familiar with the geography of Detroit. It sits right across the Detroit river from Canada. So like as a kid growing up in Detroit, we'd always go across um, to Windsor because the drinking age was 19, you know, so we'd go over there and <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a different story these days. I don't think people are, doing that quite as much really since nine 11, it's been a little bit harder to kind of go back and forth across the border. But, um, right. And, uh, Aaron, uh, the UK, uh, citizen on the call, when you do your, when you do your next, uh, trip through the U S you might want to pop in and check out Detroit. Cause it's kind of an up and coming city right now. It's the first time you could really say that credibly in the last, I don't even know how long, but you guys could maybe put it on the list. Not the most scenic, but it's kind of cool and kind of worth seeing yeah you see loads of stuff on you know about all the old um, abandoned factories and everything it looks pretty you know amazing stuff to see yeah and uh thanks to dan gilbert it's making a comeback but um at the time gerald ran that marathon it wouldn't shock me that the detroit marathon could uh could burn you out on marathons and kind of put you into a marathon remission based on the state of the city i'm imagining at that at that at that point in time but um okay cool so so you've got this kind of semi-pro relationship with marathons. And then the way that we linked up is you are also somebody, Gerald, who has um, an interest in genetics. You've done a gene food panel and you have a, uh, you've discovered that you have. Do you have one or two copies of APOE4? I just have one copy. Yes. Uh, the, I got the 3-4. Okay. So you've got one, one copy of APOE4 and you obviously as a high performance athlete, somebody that's doing pretty incredible things with running, we're really interested in nutrition. So tell us about your, your nutrition journey, P- you know, things you were reading kind of where you were a few years ago and, uh, what, what your nutrition regimen looked like for your training. Okay. So, uh, my, my nutrition was kind of influenced, uh, in my twenties by a book, uh, diet for a new America by John Robbins and Dave Scott. A lot of the triathletes back then were, were vegetarian. So for probably 20 some years, I had eat a, a vegetarian diet, but, but along with that was also a, uh, it, it included a lot of dairy too. So, uh, then so I did that for like 20, 20 some years. And, uh, and then I started, I started reading about, uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain and how I was missing out on some protein. And so I started adopting the, uh, uh, paleo diet, you know, started leaning toward more of the grass fed beef and the pastured chicken. And, uh, this was before, this was way before I had my genetics tested too, but, but I just started leaning over that. I kind of fell into the, uh, more of a paleo diet after that. Okay. And, and so, I mean, what did that look like in terms of a day of eating? So like for me, typically during that time of eating, uh, before, before gene food, but I would be, I would do eggs and bacon in the morning right? and, uh, for breakfast. And then for lunch, I was eating like a, uh, a big salad with, uh, 
either grass-fed beef or wild-caught salmon, or I would do some kind of vegetable medley with maybe some pork, you know, that I would cook. And then dinner, dinner would be, again, another, another type of protein with vegetables included. So, and then also along with that, there would be lots of coconut oil, yeah. lots of, uh, grass fed butter, uh, the Kerrygold butter. I was into that. Uh, and then also for, for, for breakfast, after, uh, before actually I ate the eggs and bacon for breakfast, I would do the, uh, I was into the, uh, bulletproof, bulletproof coffee with the uh, MCT oils. And so I was, uh, <clears throat> I was consuming that before my weight workout in the morning. That was a typical breakfast for me. The diet for the new America book is such an interesting book. I think the author of that book is actually the, one of the heirs to the Baskin Robbins fortune. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, it. Yeah. and there, and that book is very, very, very strict plant-based book. So it sounds like you did, did, did you move away from the vegetarian diet because you noticed something about that wasn't working for you? Or was it because you were influenced by kind of this, this new momentum out there conversationally about how, you know, maybe certain types of fats are healthier? Like what was it that kind of pushed you away from the vegetarian diet? Well, it was, I, no, I think it was just more of the conversation that, uh, that the, the paleo diet was the, uh, was the, the diet that we, that we all should be eating, that we've moved away from the, uh, the ancestral type of, uh, food that we should be eating. It'd be more, it'd be closer to what we should be eating. So I just kind of feel, I kind of feel into the, uh, the, the science, the science, the science behind the diet. And, uh, you know, the, you had, you had some charismatic people on the uh, internet at that time that, you know, I was at very first with Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf and a lot of those podcasts. And I just got, I kind of, you know, I, I actually thought, I kind of they thought that was, you know, that was, that was some, that was some good science with it. You know, that you, you lowered your blood sugar, that, uh, your LDL wasn't that important. Your cholesterol wasn't that important. It was all about controlling your insulin levels. And so I kind of bought, bought into that, you know, hook, line and sinker. So, uh, and I, and I just went along with that. Now, all of a sudden at, at First, when I went over to that type of diet, I immediately started gaining a lot of muscle. Yeah. You know, I, I guess the amount of protein, but I, I did put on about uh, about 20 pounds in the in the course of changing my diet to that style. And did that? Did you feel that increase in muscle? That 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 feels good, I would imagine, right? You feel stronger. You feel a little better in your clothes, kind of a thing. I did feel better at first. I, I will say that at first. Like I would say the first couple of years, I, I really did because it was kind of a combination where I wasn't, I wasn't pounding so much on the, uh, you know, so much running. I was doing, I was uh, kind of geared more to the, uh, the weight training, mm -hmm. and it kind of, it kind of just all fit together. I thought, and for the first couple of years, you know, for t maybe twenty some years of not really concentrating on running all the time, it really. Uh, I, I felt better for the for the first couple of years. But honestly, I, I I did. I thought I thought I kind of maybe put on some muscle, maybe leaned out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my I, I was just putting on lean muscle at that time, but it kept, it kept on growing and uh, I kept on getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, I mean that that's something that we talked about last week. We had on uh, Amber O'Hearn, who's the founder of the Carnivore Diet Conference, and we were talking about you know the the trade-offs that come with some of these diets. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about what we're doing here today and what we're, what we're attempting to do at gene food is we're not, uh, we're trying to be basically agnostic as to all diets. I'm sure there's people that will go. I mean, I'm confident that there's people that will go on a paleo diet and not have the reaction that we're going to talk about with you here in a minute and do just fine. Some of them are probably listening right now. And if that's the case, you know, more power to you. Um, I think the goal is to kind of try to get some frameworks in place for like, when is somebody going to potentially do well on a paleo diet? When aren't they? Well, I want to say one other thing. I want to think that it's important to mention too, though, is when I adopted the paleo diet, that was, that was the time that I actually 100% eliminated all of the, uh, of dairy that was, right. that was included. So that was, that was also an, an exclusion that, that, you know, I want to make sure that I, I point that out because even when I was vegetarian, I was kind of like lack of a vegetarian where I would actually have, uh, 
I still fell on victim of making sure I had enough protein. So I would drink whey protein. Sometimes I'd have skim milk with, uh, with grains and stuff. So yeah. that would be, I, I still did that. But when I went paleo, I knocked all the dairy out completely. Yeah. And that's one of the things just, I mean, you and I, are, you and I are in the same boat because I'm right there with you. I mean, that's, I can 100% relate. Like, I, I like listening to Mark Sisson interviews. I like listening to Rob Wolf. Those guys are both, yeah. first of all, they're in great shape. They look great. They, they do their research. The place that we part company with those guys is they do advocate very aggressively for one size fits all diet for all people. I think, I think that's fair. Um, you know, you go on some of these websites, it's like keto, the guide to keto. There's never a caveat, a single caveat listed. It's just, it's going to work for everybody. And the thing that's so challenging out there for people like you and I that are trying to figure out how to eat is I can hundred percent relate to, to what you're saying, which is you hear a really, really, really convincing commentator, somebody who really knows their stuff. You know, they're talking about this notion of quote, the science, the science says this, the science says this, you have to have MCT oil for mitochondrial function. Anybody that doesn't know that is an idiot. And you finish listening to one of those podcasts or listening to that content on YouTube, and it makes you want to run out and, <laughs> and buy MCT oil and start loading up your freezer with grass-fed beef. And basically, that's just how you, how you should eat. If I listen to an, a Nino Teichel's interview, yeah. you know, I'm more likely to order a freaking grass-fed steak at the next time I'm out eating, right? Because you, you hear these people's voices kind of in your head as you're making food decisions. Oh, 100%. 100%. It's, it's so funny how, how we can fall under the spell of the people, of the influencers that we listen to. Influencers are called influencers for a reason because they have a shitload of influence over what a lot of people do, you know, um, both consciously and, un and unconsciously. Um, so I hear you 100% and I've been there myself. Um, th the, the interesting thing though is the caveats and kind of the warnings are not usually mentioned. And what we're going to get into now is kind of this awakening you had genetically where you realized that you had this APOE4 SNP, which is a gene that's associated with a greater risk. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, Aaron will get into this in a minute, it doesn't mean you're going to develop Alzheimer's, it just means that you have an increased risk. Right. And our view here is that, you know, that SNP in concert with some others we're going to discuss that you carry, because um, you did a gene food panel, um, put you at a position where a diet that's high in saturated fat is probably not such a good idea. We talked about the good part of paleo for you. What did you notice when it started unraveling a bit, like on a day-to-day? -day? Well, I, I, I kept felt like that uh, as, as time went on, I couldn't, I couldn't never lose any weight, right? And I, just, and I also felt a little bit uh, like I had some inflammation, and I just thought, well, I'm not strict enough, you know, with my carbohydrates. And yeah. I would just keep, I'd keep rolling around with this, you know, well, I need to cut it out. I need to cut it out more. And, mm -hmm. and then I was still, I was still exercising. I was still running. I was still lifting weight. And then I would, I could go for a few days and then I'd have to introduce some carbs, you know, some potatoes or anything. And I would feel a little bit better. But then I also noticed that, uh, I never, ever had any kind of issues with my blood pressure. And I noticed that like whenever I get some physicals, work physicals, that I was starting to creep up. And I, I was just kind of, I can't believe that. Right? Yeah. I can't believe blood pressure was starting starting to creep up. And uh, I mean, even though like I probably still wore the exact same uh, uh, pants size, I just, I felt I just looked swollen as far as in my face. I felt bloated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, those were, those were some, I, also my, uh, in the last two couple of, or last couple of years, even my sleep was starting to be affected and, uh, and which eventually led me, you know, to get, to get tested, to get my genetics tested. And that was, that was a big eye opener right there. Yeah. We're going to get into that in a minute. And, you know, we're going to mention this a few times in the, in the, in the podcast, and one other thing, like, so when I was getting my blood work, I, I consistently, you know, I would get my blood work and I noticed my, my cholesterol just kept climbing up mm -hmm. and my LDL markers kept climbing up. And I was like, well, that's not supposed to be there. And again, then I would do some research and, and then I would, you know, hear, you know, the, uh, a lot of the, uh, common theme is, you know, just ignore the cholesterol. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not truly a marker. So there was a lot of noise out there, you know, doing some research that it was, it was, it was confusing, but I did feel like that, you know, some things were happening was, you know, my cholesterol was right, was rising. 
and my blood pressure c- continued to increase. And uh, and I and also one of the other things was that when I was trying to build my mileage back up, I noticed I, c- I couldn't do it anymore. I, mm-hmm. I didn't have the, I didn't have the endurance that I used to have. So those those three things is what I noticed with, with big things. Yeah, that's and and that's the that's the crazy part about this whole thing is that you find that these issues are starting to kind of creep up on you. Sounds like you knew intuitively and also just objectively based on data you're getting that there are these issues that you're having. But the problem is, is you you kind of go back to your community that you started to trust, which is, you know, in some cases, it's going to be people that are on a vegan diet, they're not doing well. I mean, today we're going to highlight how in some cases going on a strict paleo diet, like you're doing that's high in these fats, is just doesn't work for people. Look, Aaron and, Aaron and I have talked about it on p- previous episodes. I think that's also true of vegan diets. And we're not here to selectively criticize one diet. This is just an incredible story that you have. But I think it... I think the lessons of your story kind of span beyond the borders of any one diet, because I want to just get more into this idea of you had these issues that were developing and then you went back basically to your community, almost to like virtually ask and be like, okay, well, I'm having these issues. What does paleo influencer one, two or three have to say about this? And they never will concede that it could be their diet. <laughs> They're just like, oh, people have a cholesterol that goes up on this diet. Oh, cholesterol is not dangerous. Those studies are just bullshit. Oh, people's blood pressure is going up on paleo. Oh, you just need more salt. We have a supplement we're selling here. Take more salt. That'll that'll fix it. Right. That's what I hear you saying is that you went back and they have all the rebuttals ready, whether it's the vegans or the, they're just like, well, no, rebuttal ABC. That's the, all that science. You know, that's just bullshit. That, that doesn't exist. Is that Was that a, your experience? Is that the first place you went yeah, that's it. No, that's exactly right, and that's why it was uh, it was this uh, it was like I was in this vicious cycle, and I and I couldn't get the results that I got at the very beginning, and they were getting and they were getting worse, and I felt like I was I was I was actually getting I felt like I was getting old, right, and that's for the first time. And I, I know other and then, and again, I'm like you, John. I I don't criticize any other diets out there. But I was just trying to find something that was going to work. I was trying to figure out what was going to work with me because I knew my body for so well, and I've, I've been an athlete my whole life that I knew something was not was not right. I wasn't feeling as good as I used to feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. L- look, I want to say before we get into this piece, the genetics piece of this equation is one piece of the puzzle. You have genetics. We believe at Gene Food that it's an important piece. It's at the foundation. It's not the only piece. Aaron, who's going to weigh in here in a minute, likes to say that, look, we're just scratching at the surface of kind of the potential of these genetic markers. Having said that, if you make the analogy of the entire genome is basically the highway across the entire country from New York to LA, these SNPs, these, these genotypes that we're going to talk about are basically the major cities. So they're better mapped. They're known quantities along the road. There's a whole bunch of cities that we have yet to discover that could become boom towns and could build up and be, you know, overnight gold rush cities that we're going to be talking about in the future. And I want to have some humility as I delve into this topic and not say, oh, it's all genetics. Everything's genetics. That's all you need to know. Right. But having said that, the genetics is definitely a piece of the puzzle. There definitely is good science there. We definitely can use it as a foundational tool. And if you're somebody like Gerald, who then goes and does the work of truly digging in, like we're about to talk about with your labs and you pair the labs with the genetics, you are well on your way to developing something that's a pretty cool personalized regimen. So you come to, you come to gene food, you're eating paleo and you're, results come back tell us about your experience basically in terms of like what your reaction was when you saw our diet type that you you got you were put into the lean machine category of our diet type we have basically a myers-briggs of nutrition so lean machine from ten thousand feet is high fat diet except for you know mufa and pufa monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat very low saturated fat diet you're very likely lactose intolerant so the dairy wasn't going to work and you have a little more wiggle room in terms of your insulin response like your your carbohydrate clearance and so you you probably are somebody that does have more room for a diet that's higher in complex carbohydrate so just to set the table for people that don't know so anyway tell us your experience in terms of how you reacted once this you saw this information well i when i saw it it was like it was uh, the like the light went off because when I kept noticing that my cholesterol continued to rise, and when I would you know look at the only way to really uh, you know lower cholesterol, and and I when, 
And so I came from this background, you know, I needed Caldwell Escalines of the World, and I've read all those books, and, and I thought, oh my goodness, I left it, I, this makes so much sense, because I, I felt really good on that, but, and then, but there was a component from the report, like, you know, I should cut out dairy, and, and that I do well with uh, polyunsaturated fats, and, and, and then I can also get by with eating maybe a higher glycemic food, and all of those things, i I knew that deep down inside, you know, I, my intuition, I knew that I did well on those things. They never bothered. Me. And so it was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a shock to me, but it was, it, it was like a revelation, right? It was kind of like, God, that, that's, that was my intuition was talking to me and telling me, you know, that's what I should eat. And then I immediately went in a hundred percent, right? I went full board and uh, probably for the first two months, I guess, I didn't need, I didn't need any kind of animal product at all. I just stayed strictly to basically the lean machine recommendation. Except just to interrupt you there, the lean machine is uh, the diet, that diet type's not a vegan diet type. It definitely. No, it's not. It, yeah. it, it includes, it includes like the 10% of like wild salmon. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and, oh, but I just wanted, I just wanted to kind of this. I, I was really wanting to look at some markers, so I had, I had, I had the cholesterol markers, so I wanted to see if I could really flip this around, right? So I started, I started eating that way, and uh, I immediately started losing weight. And I'm, and John, I was eating continuously. There was, there was no caloric control. Uh, I could eat as much as I wanted. I mean, people were just amazed at the size of breakfast. I was eating like I would eat a cup of rolled oats, a cup of blueberries, an apple, a banana that was having flat food in that along with uh, oat milk. Uh, that would be like a typical breakfast. It would be like a 600 calorie breakfast, you could say. And then lunch was a uh, big salad with like the bonzo beans. Uh, dinner was again, was, was uh, maybe four slices of Ezekiel bread. It was, uh, uh, four servings of black beans or lentils, uh, something along those lines, and, and sweet potatoes or regular potatoes. So those are the typical diet. And then, and then I started to. Uh, so that was the first couple of months, and then my cholesterol dropped I think, like 175 to like 131 on my like in within two weeks in my uh, on my LDL. I have your charts here that you sent us. It looks like actually at your peak under the paleo diet, it was 190, 192 milligrams per deciliter and it dropped yeah. to 88. And yeah. when we, when we yeah. saw those numbers internally, we were like, oh, okay, well, he must have been statinized too. I mean, and, but you said you, you didn't take a, you didn't take a statin and it dropped. Oh, no. Yeah. No, no. I'm, I, I have never taken a statin. No. Yeah. So it dropped yeah. over at, from your peak. It dropped over, looks like a hundred points in your LDL, your, your LDL cholesterol. And, um, we have your ApoB number for the people listening at home. ApoB is apolipoprotein B. It's, there's one ApoB protein for every LDL particle. So if you know your LDL particle number, that's great. If you know your ApoB number, you basically know your LDL particle number. So his ApoB was 73, which puts you, I think at an LDL particle of somewhere like around 900, um, which is really cool. Um, and even as I hear you saying that, like, you know, I think to myself, you're talking about basically going and, and doing a, basically being an athlete that's running on glucose and stored glycogen kind of in the old school swim team model. And there's so many influencers on the internet who are like, just so dismissive of that now. And you start hearing that and it influences how you want to eat unless in your case, it works for you. So, um, before, so we're going to bring in Aaron here. I, I want to talk about like the some of the genetic markers. But do you, what else do you have to add to this kind of transition, Gerald? Before we kind of talk about in our scoring system why we assigned you to this diet. Um, okay. You and I have kind of worked together, you know, offline as well, and just um, and you're very also very very focused on the APOE status and basically doing what you can for your cognitive health. I would like to make a point. Then I started, you know, to make sure that I had. The, uh, I started incorporating, you know, the wild salmon to make sure I was uh, protecting the DHA amount, you know, that's going into my brain. So, you know, to put another 
some scientific literature that's come out, you know, that, you know, the DHA is important for, uh, for people that do have the, uh, ally, the, uh, the APOE4. So, so I did start including, I kind of eat wild salmon almost like a supplement, you know, mm-hmm. I have, you know, at least two days a week, but I, uh, I was, as I told you, I did get my uh, omega-3 index. Uh, tested this past Saturday, so I'll get, I'll find out whether, whether or not, you know, two servings, you know, two servings a week is enough, or if I need to, you know, move up even more than that. Maybe so. some cod liver oil, or algae oil, or whatever. Um, and then also just, uh, for the people that are kind of saying, because there are, there is a camp of people that don't believe that LDL is causal in heart disease, and they don't think that a cholesterol of 266 or an LDL cholesterol of 192 milligrams for deciliters is really, really freaking high is something to worry about. Your blood pressure also came way down. Oh yeah, my blood pressure dropped from like 155 to like when you saw it. I, I sent you a picture of it. It was like 110 over 70 did, uh, yesterday. Yeah, but that's so. that's yeah. My blood pressure dropped, and those are another. Those are all uh, important markers, even for the protection of uh, of Alzheimer's. You know, as you know, that, that's what you know. That's what I look at as my biggest risk for the for the next 10 years. You know. Is, is protecting, you know, blood flow, uh, my, my lipid profile, and uh, my cognitive health. So. so what we did in preparation for the podcast is, Aaron, we looked at your charts, and basically Aaron picked out some of the um, highest science score markers in your charts that would explain um, why, because again, we want to have a framework here, you know, it, some people, it could go the other way. We want to try to have an explanation as best we can with what we know, which is not everything, sure. why this happened in your body. So Aaron, um, do you want to run through some of these markers that we flagged and kind of explain, uh, with, uh, Gerald, why he was scored, how he was? Yeah, sure. So one particular sort of thing that you've talked about just with John there is your sort of switch away from saturated fats towards a, you know, reducing your saturated fat intake, but keeping those high quality, the, the wild caught salmon to get your EPA and your DHA and things like that. And that's quite a big part of our diet plan. Yeah. And so looking through your saturated fat snips, there was a couple that really jumped out to me. And the one that really, really jumped out is the APOA2 or the apolipoprotein A2. So this is a protein that forms or is a component of HDL, HDL particles in the blood, and it's thought to stabilize their structure. And the SNP in particular that we're interested in is RS5082, and the risk allele for that is G, and the non-risk is A, and you were actually carrying two risk alleles. And if you read oh. in the literature about this, those two risk alleles correlate with increased levels of LDL, increased levels of total cholesterol, and an increased risk of diabetes. And the really interesting bit is that if you have a high saturated fat intake at the same time, this makes those markers even worse. So it was really cool when sort of John shared your data with me and sort of had a look through it, that as soon as you cut out that saturated fat, your LDL, your total cholesterol basically, well, more than halved um, just by cutting out the saturated fat. So it was really cool to see these big studies out there that you can read about and these sort of read these effects, but actually seeing it in a person who's made that dietary change and seeing that huge uh, decrease in your total cholesterol and your LDL uh, cholesterol as well, that was a really cool one to see. So that was probably the most important SNP, I would say, on your um, diet plan to show, you know, to sort of direct which sort of way you were going to go. As part of the scoring system, like a- APOA2, I think that has a high science score, but there's also the APOE4 SNP and then ACE and then also PCSK9. I think we should talk about all of those. Yeah. So APOE4, you kind of talked about it and that's a a really interesting one because it has the neurological issues associated with it. And then there's also issues with how you would maybe respond to dietary fat. And it's interesting because there's a lot of people out there talking about maybe a ketogenic diet being protective for people who have the APOE4 um, genotype. And we kind of, we've bounced around this a lot because obviously, you know, that's really cool if it's protective fat. But the other side of it is that it also has quite negative effects if you have a high fat diet as well. Mm-hmm. So we've sort of been trying to figure out what the best way to incorporate this into our diet plan is, is, you know, and we went the other way of basically if you have 
this genotype, the APOE4, of which you, uh, I think you were a heterozygote, you have one, cap, one copy of it, yeah. Yeah, then we would reduce, suggest that you reduce your saturated fat intake as a way of, again, controlling your cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol as well. And it seems to have worked quite well in relation to that. And then with the ACE? So ACE is going in a slightly different direction. So that's not one of the uh, ones relating to cholesterol. This is one that's relating to your blood pressure. And again, this is really cool how tightly it marries up with your, uh, what you sort of experienced, Gerald. So just to quickly go over, ACE is angiotensin 1 converting enzyme. It basically plays a key role in regulating your blood pressure. So your body secretes this angiotensin and ACE converts it into its active form. And this angiotensin then causes things like your uh, smooth muscles around your blood vessels to constrict. It increases your blood pressure and it stimulates fluid uptake in the kidney. So all of this mm. basically goes together and increases your blood pressure. So there's one snip in particular that's really cool, RS4343. G is the risk and A is normal. And again, you had two risk alleles for that SNP. Oh, wow. And what that correlates with is people having a higher blood pressure, especially during exercise. But they also have an increased weight, um, which is potentially due to the fluid absorption in the kidneys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also sodium is contraindicated for that. Yeah. And the sodium well, um, intake as well. Well, that's exactly how I felt. I just felt after a couple of years on that, I just felt that I was carrying around 20 pounds of fluid. And, and like I said, I, I lost 23 pounds when I changed the diet. And But if you saw my waist size, I mean, I still wear a size 30 waist. It was still a size 30, but it you could tell I lost 20 pounds, but it was like, where was it coming from? It was like it was all just water from, you know, that I'd lost. It, 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 was, it was amazing how, that, how, that, how different I felt. And also the blood pressure, how I felt, it, it, it allowed me to sleep better at night because the blood pressure actually was, for me, it felt like it was causing some anxiety. So Aaron, mechanistically, in terms of nutritional inputs, on that ACE issue, that, that is, you could theorize that all the, basically the animal flesh, like these super high sodium foods were, were really exacerbating that in Gerald's case. Yeah, I mean, definitely. So we, we have a little subsection on the thing for micronutrients um, and sodium was one of the ones that flagged up as, you know, you should possibly consider reducing. Um, yeah. But as part of the wider diet plan as well, by making that transition away from lots of animal products, you probably were also reducing your sodium intake yeah. as well. And that's probably one of the reasons why your blood pressure, again, you know, you went from being on the sort of the borderline of having an issue to sort of fitting slap bang in the really healthy uh, blood pressure readings. Yeah, my, my report said to reduce sodium. So I went, I went all in. I, I eliminated all salt. <laughs> so there was no salt. There wasn't no salt that I was getting externally, you know, from, from added salt to food. So... It was it was only food. It was the only sodium I was getting was actually food that, that was actually included in the food, so the whole food. So, so it, did, it made a huge difference to that. Yeah, and I mean the thing that's so interesting about that, just to harken back to what Gerald and I were just talking a minute ago, is that when you're out there looking for answers and you're looking you're looking to influencers for information. Um, and again, look, the the paleo world is the world that we're highlighting today for one very narrow reason, which is we're talking about Gerald's story. I mean, we, you know, we could have somebody on who was on a strict vegan diet and didn't do well in it and talk about the reasons for that as well. But so I'm not trying to pick on paleo, but right. I hope that I hope that there could be somebody listening who could say, you know, who's maybe not allowing themselves to acknowledge an insight that they may have reached sort of that's creeping in the back of their mind and then having that insight sort of stripped from them by very adamant messaging from an influencer or a series of influencers because one of the things that the influencer community in these paleo and low carb circles loves to do is tell you how amazing salt is for you that there's no evidence whatsoever for a high sodium diet contributing to high blood pressure it doesn't exist you know, and in fairness, we have a blog post on the gene food site about how, you know, this can be an issue of mineral balance. But look, I mean, this is something that is subject to individual response. So it is possible that you could be having too much sodium and then that sodium could be causing your blood pressure to rise. That, that actually is something that's possible. It's not bad science. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual sort of like thing that we can, we can tell based on people's genetics. So 
um, you know, if you have high blood pressure, maybe skip the sodium supplements that the, that the paleo influencers are, um, are selling online. Um, okay. So what, what else do we have, Aaron, in terms of the positive genes for the carbohydrate clearance? Oh, right. Yeah. So they was kind of, you know, saying maybe you should reduce this aspect in your diet, but we don't want people to think that this is all the diet plan is. It's saying you can't have that. You can't have that. You can't have that. We also take into account, you know, your positive SNPs, things where you do well and factor that into the diet as well. And one thing that particularly flagged up that John sort of talked about is that you actually could deal really well with a carbohydrate intake. So we see lots of people with their nutrition plans and they may have SNPs which predispose them to type 2 diabetes or they sort of, you know, a poor insulin response, things like that. You seem to carry next to none of those SNPs. So things like uh, ADCY5 which regulates insulin. Again, you had, you know, you uh, had a really good score for that. Another one that we're particularly interested in is ADRA A2. And taking them together, these two SNPs, but then also all of the other SNPs we look at in carbohydrates, we could sort of pull out that you'd likely do well on a plant-based diet, especially one, you know, that's rich in fiber, complex carbohydrates. You'd be able to tolerate this well. It shouldn't really influence your blood sugar. Um, levels significantly when you do that. You shouldn't see these peaks and troughs that some people have. And that then sort of factors into the putting you onto the lean machine diet where you, we can bring some of your fat intake down, but push the carbohydrate one up a little bit. And that could provide you with a better sort of energy source for all of your endurance running that you were talking about earlier. That's exactly what I'm seeing. And then the other thing that ties in as well, and this is a sort of a thing that's close to John's heart, um, <laughs> is bringing in the sterols, so the plant um, plant fats. So we're currently sort of thinking about this and seeing how maybe a lot of people who bounce off vegan diets or pl- very heavily plant-based diets have issues absorbing these sterols and dealing with them. And looking at your sterile score, you scored well in that regard. So again, this is probably why when you, you are able to tolerate a quite heavy plant-based diet quite well because you're able to deal with these sterols you're able to eliminate them properly. You don't get any of the sort of the, the negative side effects that some people report when they have a heavily plant-based diet or some people maybe have bounced off for those reasons. So yeah, looking at it as a whole, there's some negatives taking you away from saturated fats, but there was a lot of positives pushing you towards the complex fiber-rich carbohydrates as well. And just to riff on that with the sterile issue, um, it's pretty interesting when you look at Gerald's lipid score some people listening may think well what happened to his triglycerides what happened to his uh his hdl so from his worst score um in terms of when his cholesterol was 266 and his ldl cholesterol was 192 his triglycerides went from 83 milligrams per deciliter in the green in most labs to 97 slight uptick his hdl went from 57 to 48 slight downturn um but to speak to that sterile issue in terms of what was causing him to be uh, to have his LDL numbers go out of range, it was clearly that he had very cholesterol-rich LDL particle because of the fact that he had his triglycerides that were in range. And when he started eating a diet that was very plant-heavy, his LDL cholesterol went way down. And part of what's included in the LDL cholesterol number is not just the actual mass of cholesterol, it's also the sterile. Um, and so the issue he was dealing with was basically, it seems as though in response to a high fat diet, his body was making, making a ton more, uh, a ton more cholesterol. Yeah, exactly that, John. So that's, uh, the genetic analysis there, Gerald. I think it's interesting what you mentioned about carrying the water weight. That's really interesting. I, I thought so too. I thought that was, uh, you know, just watching it happen to myself. I thought it was, it was very insightful when started you know, removing the saturated fat, but it felt like it wasn't that I was losing so much body fat. It was like I was losing so much edema or some, so much water weight I was holding. You know, it was, it was, it was you know, because I'd always heard, you know, the inflammation was caused from eating so much, so much carbohydrates and having insulin levels high. Well, that didn't, that, that didn't work with me. It was kind of the opposite. It was almost like the saturated fat was cause, causing inflammation and, and uh, and that's what was causing me to hold so much water. Because again, I didn't I didn't actually go on any kind of a diet whatsoever as far as uh, calorie content went. I didn't restrict any calories, and I still lost twenty twenty two twenty three pounds. 
So it, it, you know, to me, that was like inflammation, you know? So once you made the switch on your diet, how did you yeah. find your, like, um, your ability to undertake, like, your endurance runs that you were talking about? Did you see any shift oh. in that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I should have I should have mentioned that. So my endurance just took off. Honest to goodness, I, I couldn't tell you, like I, I told you, I told you guys at the beginning of this uh, interview that that I, I ran 24 miles uh, this past Sunday. I could have ran yesterday. I could have gone out and ran yesterday. And you know, being a 59 year old man, I I have no pain, no inflammation, no knee problems, nothing. And my endurance just took off. I mean, it just. I, where before when I was eating the uh, paleo, I mean, about five or six miles, I was uh, I was I was struggling. I had to do like a, a lot more uh, walking interspersed with my running to be able to like get the mileage up. And so I would just kind of thought, well, I guess I'm never going to be able to get my mileage way up there again. But uh, no, it's been it's been quite the opposite. So my endurance is shot through the roof. And do you think that's just based on you've got more energy or is it like you're saying that you just, you know, you don't get those inflammatory issues that your recovery is much better as well? Aaron, I think it's exactly that. I think it's, I think it's the inflammatory response that that's taken place because I was actually trying to see a podiatrist to try to figure out what was going on in, in the uh, ball of my foot because I was getting some pain in the ball of my foot and it's completely gone. And uh, so I, I look at it, is more of a, uh, inflammation has cleared and, and there's not an issue with that anymore, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, that's why I was asking just that inflammation. There's, there's no real way we can sort of measure it really well, the, you know, the inflammatory things. But just when you're sort of talking about things, looking at your snips, the things you've talked about with John, it just immediately yeah. in my head was making think that, yeah, your inflammation must just be getting, you know, you must be having a lower level of systemic inflammation. Yeah. I, I wish I would have gotten my CRP measured before. You know, because it's it's like it was below a one. You know, I wish but after the fact, but I wish I would have got it measured. Bef- you know, before I, I switched over to the lean machine diet, I, I wish I'd had it before. But because I I started really getting so excited, I, I started getting all kinds of blood tests done. You know, to see all see how good it was. You know, how 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 good I was feeling. I just wanted some uh, documentation, just to you know have some numbers to back it up. I wish I would have had more numbers before. <laughs> So you can see, you know, the size of the cholesterol and everything. Yeah, but when you did get your CRP done after eating this way, it was really low, if I remember correctly. I don't remember exactly what it was, but... Yeah, it was below one. I think another thing that you've done a really good job, uh, Gerald, that we could kind of close out to give people just some wisdom on um, is this whole idea of you're being very vigilant about balancing your omega-6 to omega-3 ratios while on a plant-based diet too. Correct. Um, because again, I really do want to emphasize and just keep emphasizing this point. We're not advocating for a one size fits all diet for anyone. We have other diets in our matrix that are very low glycemic, like a popular diet in our matrix is forager. Forager is a very low glycemic diet. It wouldn't be the same protocol at all that Gerald's on. But, um, you know, you're even paying attention, Gerald, like in terms of the supplements you're taking to your omega-6 count. Do you want to speak to a little bit of that in terms of, uh, what your outlook is on those issues? As far as the, uh, Supplements. I, I am. I am taking some phospholipid uh, omega threes. Um, and based on uh, Rhonda Patrick, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's research, you know that APOE fours have have a hard time getting the uh, DHA into the body without the phospholipid form. Okay. So, uh, so I have been supplementing um, uh, omega threes like the. Uh, uh, the one there's one that Nordic sells, and but then, but then really, like I tried fish roe also. Uh, she's a big believer in the fish roe, and it has a that's like double the amount of like a typical wild salmon. But I tried fish roe for a while, but also in her report, you know, says that actually fish just supplementing fish, you know, wild caught salmon. And I eat a lot of I eat that, but that that actually does better with the uh, APLE fours. I was doing, I, w- I had been doing just regular fish oil too, like uh, just, you know, the uh, cod liver oil also. But uh, it seems to be that, according to the research that, that I've been reading, that the phospholipid is the best source as far as someone with, uh, you know, my, my genetic makeup. 
as far as my normal routine, I take a, uh, an NAC supplement. I take some magnesium at night. Uh, I do take vitamin D3. Uh, I take uh, vitamin K2. You know, just uh, uh, I watch those those numbers t- with the vitamin uh, D3. I make sure I have enough K2 also. Well, Gerald, this has been a really cool conversation. I'm glad we did this. Um, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your story. I hope that it'll help some people that are listening. And um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna keep 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 talking and keep in touch, and you know, be uh, be with you on your on your journey here. And um, thank you for your time, man. It's been a lot of fun chatting. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate it, and, uh, and and I would just encourage anyone. Like again, I mean, what what my uh, diet report came out could be completely different from anyone else, but I I would encourage anybody to uh, to take the report and get and at least look at the template, what it should look like as far as what the genetic makeup is, because uh, when I get asked all the time as far as like diet, you know, nutrition advice. And I and I used to years ago, you know, whatever our diet I was on, if I was if I was uh, if I was doing well on it, you know, you just want to okay, just match what I do. But I I have uh, abandoned that thought. Whereas now I believe what you should do is is you should get your genetic testing done and send it in to uh, you know to find out like find out what it says in gene food. And I've I've actually recommended to several colleagues at work, and uh, and they've been they've been very uh, Either impressed, surprised, or you know what they thought they could, what they thought they should be eating would be completely different. So it's it's, uh, it's eye opening, and I think that I think that's a great template to start out and, and see what could be. Eating. And I appreciate it, Aaron, giving me all the advice. I appreciate that. No worries. It's been great to talk to you. It's great when I get feedback from uh, from anyone, really, even you know if it's not positive or ne- positive or negative. But it's really it is really cool when you get someone who's responded so well to the diet plan and having sort of such a profound effect. Yep. It's always really cool to hear that. Yeah. yeah. I would just close in support of what Gerald said. It could be gene food does not have to be gene food. You know, we're not the only game in town. Yeah. Of course I believe in our product, but there's a lot of people telling you how to eat and as well meaning as they may be. And as much as it may work for them, it might not work for you. And it's sometimes it's really hard for those of us that are kind of out there looking for these answers to to, to disassociate from the strong opinions of influencers and kind of go out on our own. And I think that um, Gerald's story is a really inspiring example of why striking out on your own and figuring out what works for you is um, can be a very powerful way to take control of your health. So, all right. Thanks, guys. All right. Cool. Thanks. See you later. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron. The Gene Food Podcast is our attempt to synthesize the latest developments in the fields of genetics, nutrition, and medicine, and offer you practical tips and stories you can use in your own unique health journey. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information online at mygenefood.com.